do this here. Today, I think it better be. I think <laughs> you'll let me know in the comments whether it is or isn't. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. <laughs> my name is Michael Markowski. I get my own intro wrong. <laughs> How you guys doing? Today we are going to be recreating another painting by another one of my favorite artists and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I'm probably not the only one who is a fan of the great... Come on... Leonardo da Vinci. So we're going to be looking at this painting here. This is a painting that's been attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. It's not 100% conclusively affirmed to be made by him. Some people believe it was made by a student of his. Some people think it's a, a, a fake. We, we know it's been around for at least 300 years. It, it, it's, it, some people think it's been around for a lot longer than that, and it obviously was painted by Leonardo, but there is... I just want to say right off the top there, there is some dispute over this image. In fact, there's really only 25 paintings by Leonardo da Vinci that are agreed upon as being by the hand of the great master. There's a lot of sketches, we're going to take a look at them here in a moment, and, and those are just really very little dispute over them. Um, many of them are actually owned by the Queen of England. Um, but... Uh, Today's painting, the reason why we're doing this painting, and, and this probably it is not a familiar painting to a lot of people who may even know da Vinci relatively well, is because just a few days ago we spent time talking about value, and we did these value scales, right? And one of the things when we're talking about value is managing contrast between light and dark. So what I wanted to do was to paint a painting that had relatively little color in it so we could just really talk about uh, how we can modify one color with some black, white, and gray or tints, tones, and shades, right? So we've talked all about that. If you're like, what on earth are we talking about? There is a link in the description to that video. Whoa, look at all of the... The, I, the the chat is blown up here, here. so uh, and you'll you'll excuse my pronunciation here. I am not Italian, but my my uh, the way that I would pronounce this is La Scapigliata, right? And or the lady with disheveled hair. So we'll just say the lady with disheveled hair or La Scapigliata for those of you. Maybe if if someone has a better pronunciation who's uh, authentically Italian, let me know. <laughs> And then we'll, we, uh, I will correct myself. So we are going to make this painting on a nine by 12 size canvas. Of course you can use whatever size of canvas you want. And there is an outline that I've done using my iPad Pro and the Procreate app and my P Apple Pencil, right? So I just trace over all the lines here. And if you want to download this free template there is a, a Dropbox link in the description below. I think it's maybe the third link down there, second or so. And you'll see there's this folder with tons and tons of, these are all artworks that we've already made, or there's maybe five folders here that don't have artwork. Today's file is actually all the way at the bottom. And there's gonna be, if you're watching this a year from now, there's probably gonna be more afterwards, but here's where it's located because we're eventually gonna make our way back here in another three months when we do another Leonardo da Vinci painting, the painting that is the most expensive painting ever sold at auction, the Salvatore Mundi, which sold for $450 million just a few years ago. So that's 
also going to be in this folder eventually. So click in here, you're gonna see there's three files, two of which are JPEGs, ones that are, well, so <laughs> we have two versions of this, one's a JPEG, one's a PDF, and then of course the original image. And I should say also I've cropped this uh, from its original, um, so we'll take a look at that here in a moment, but I haven't really changed or altered the painting in any majorly significant way here. Um, before we jump right into the painting, I wanna let you know that there's a private Facebook group just for people like yourself to uh, meet other great artists, people at, at various different uh, skill levels, some people who've literally just begun, about 100 people just signed up over the past month, and people who've been painting with me for years now, right? So it's a really great way of uploading your work there and getting feedback, not just for me, because this Saturday is gonna be our first feedback episode of the new year. And so I go through here and I take all the images, the new images off and we talk about them and I give people feedback on how to make them even better. Uh, Cause usually that's what people wanna be able to do. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about the biography of Leonardo da Vinci here in a moment and uh, this specific painting. But before we get to that, I wanna do the, the image transfer and get this painting started so that it can dry while, we, um, uh, while we're chatting away here. Okay, wow, there's a lot of comments. So let's, uh, so if you've downloaded this file, you will have it printed. You can then take it, print it out on your um, inkjet printer. I have an inkjet printer, laser jet printer at home. And I'm gonna I'm gonna stick this pretty much right in the middle. Sometimes I do move it a little bit off to the side, but I think the reason why sometimes I move it off to the side or up or down is just because I might feel like it needs a little bit more breathing room. Like I think you know if I was to move it anyway, I would probably move it a little bit off to the side to this side because. Whenever you have someone looking into to this space, you usually want to have more space in front of the face than in behind the face. Okay. And this is not a, all that complex of an image, so it's only going to take maybe a minute or two to do this process. So I'm using carbon paper. You should be able to find carbon paper uh, from your local art supply store, and if not, um, you can certainly or use the link in the description to order it online. So you can also use graphite paper, same thing. This is one-sided carbon paper, so you just always have to make sure you're doing the right side, right? The shiny side down. Okay. And I'm just gonna use a red pencil. You can use a pen. You can even use, uh, I don't know, a spoon handle or a toothpick or whatever, because it doesn't matter if it actually leaves a mark here because it's the pressure of the pencil or the tool that create the, the, um, the mark on the canvas itself, right? I just use a colored pencil so that I can see very clearly what lines I've already traced because I've done this hundreds, well, not just with these episodes done this hundreds of times, but over the years I've used this technique many, many times. And I will tell you there's <laughs> There has been many instances where I've got all the way to the end, I've peeled the tape off, and I've started, and I realize, oh no, I forgot the eyes or the nose. Ah! And then you try to line it back up again, and you'll never get it lined right back up again, ever. Trust me, I have tried uh, many times. So. You'll notice that this image might, you know, all of these tracings sometimes differ just a little bit from the original, which, because my priority is creating something that will work as a template. Um, so sometimes I have to, you know, make a few little creative choices in there to help what I, the you make do this pull process a little bit easier. Okay, so just a few more of these. And you can see I'm not doing, you know, every little aspect of it. I'm sort of simplifying it even a little bit because I just want to be able to make sure I've got it on here. 
the basic composition. And let's just make sure it's there. And it is. And I just realized I did not sand this canvas. Ugh. Okay, so if you've gessoed it like I have, let's just, uh, this is probably gonna smudge a little bit, but that's okay. Since a little bit of my sanding took a bit of the face off, I just want to make sure I got some of those lines there. Okay. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a little bit of warm yellow here. Now, <laughs> um, I am going. Th I'm going to add another color on top of this, but this is the way that I generally approach every painting that I do. I've been doing this for a while and I really like the results, but if uh, we look at the original here, Leonardo is famous for using this technique, not this color, but this technique. This technique is called uh, applying an imprimatura to the canvas. I'm not sure I just use this. I'm using a smaller brush here. Um, and this technique is about uh, using a little bit of color to, to help um, give the painting a starting place. And, and artists like Leonardo um, really popularize this technique because it actually saves artists time. When the when the when we obliterate the white of the canvas, uh, it actually helps us to um, just get the. We're not having to worry about what where the next the first brush stroke is going to go. It's already there. We've, that was was one of the first steps, right? I saw someone made a really interesting comment. I can't remember where here on the um, just about. You know, people who might be a little bit anxious about starting a painting. You know, and that, oh, I don't know, I feel so stressed about that first brush stroke, and i got to make sure it's perfect. And then by putting the imprimatura down, it's also a great way of just really quickly getting, you know, but like breaking the... the, uh... uh the dam and getting on with business, right? Sort of like, uh, what, what would you call that kind of therapy? You know, where they, if you're afraid of flying, they put you on an airplane and you go skydiving. If you're afraid of spiders, they put you in a room full of tarantulas kind of thing, right? So this just, I don't know if it's the same thing. Um, okay. And I like this warm yellow too, just because it imbues everything, all the, the the next few layers with this nice warm glow. You know, when we look at them side by side, obviously it looks it looks different. We are I'm going to put a bit more of a brown over top of this at, before we start painting, but I think this is a, a kind of a really nice start for us. Okay, so. Um, just wondering if we should start that color now. I might blow dry this and then we'll let's let's do a little bit of painting before we, we talk about Leonardo. Because I know there's sometimes people who fall behind near this stage, so uh, that'll give people a little bit of time to catch up while we're talking about who Leonardo was. So I'm gonna blow dry this and then I'm gonna apply the next color. Uh, I, I guess it's not the imp what is the the imprimatur is the first paint or, or the before the painting layer so then we do the second layer I'm sure there's an, the Italians would have a name for it
Okay, so let's let it, let's um actually make this next step of the process and get that going because I think that would be helpful. Okay, so we've got a this nice warm yellow, and now what we want to do is we want to apply a brown over top of it, a kind of a little bit of a dirty brown, and that's going to kind of and we'll put a little bit of maybe a little bit of white in order to also uh, cover a bit of this warm yellow because we also we don't want it to get too dark too quickly so let's uh, get a little bit more paint out here I'm trying to think of which colors we'll end up using um, it's a good question. You know, I'm not even. Uh, I think I don't, I'm going to put almost all the colors on here. I think a color I probably won't use is uh, my my cool red, just off the top of my head. So I don't think I'll use that. Why did I put my warm <laughs> red there? That is, uh, oh, goof. So let's, that is strange. A little brain fart there. Okay, oh, and some white. Let's maybe mix this on here. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to mix. I think I want to, I, I want to mix a warm brown, and so that's I think I will need my warm blue here. Not too much of it, but uh, okay. So let's put some warm blue on here as well. So what I'm doing is I've taken my warm red, my warm yellow, Let's take a lot more warm yellow and a little bit of warm blue. In fact, I'm going to put a bunch more of it on here. And we can use this color uh, that w we're making here eventually to do the, the actual lines on the painting. So, that's our brown. Now I think I'm gonna end up using a little bit of um, cool blue in here just to pull it a little bit closer to the neutral core here but I'm going to take some white and let's just see it's still very um, it's still it's almost like a little bit too chocolatey Okay, 
next what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, in lieu of water, if you don't have uh, anything else, you, I suppose you could use a bit of water. What I'm going to use is matte medium. Matte medium is paint that has no color in it. You can get gloss medium. I'm going to put matte medium in here. This is going to thin this paint out a little bit. make it a little bit more transparent. Now I'm just going to take a bit of cool blue and put that in here. Oh, that's too much. Went a little bit gr more green than I was hoping, because I did that a little bit aggressively. But actually, you know what? Maybe that's not bad. But that's actually pretty close. I just usually like to do it a little bit more in moderation. So just to explain what happened here. So basically what I did is I made a warm brown, right? And a warm brown is going to exist sort of in this area of the color wheel. It's pretty close to the neutral core, right? It's like we made an orange. And then we took some warm blue, so it pulled this orange closer to the neutral core, right? And then what I did is I took some of this cool blue, and it took it from sort of just being here, and it yanked it even a little bit closer, even a little bit more into this greener area. Because remember, our cool colors have a little bit of that greenish quality. Right? Okay. Now... I'm going to put a little bit more matte medium in here because my, my fear is it's going to be a little bit too opaque and I don't want to obliterate all my pencil lines that I put on here. So we will see. That's okay. Okay, so let's move this out of the way. And the moment of truth here. So at the moment, a lot of the, the lines have disappeared. But what I'm doing is I'm putting this on and I'm going to spread it out. And I may even decide to wipe a little bit of it off. Kind of like staining this surface here. You gotta be kind of working quickly here. You don't you're not fiddling, you're getting that paint on because the it's gonna start drying. We want it to be kind of thin. Okay, so let's just see if I can. This is kind of a used rag. It's got some dried paint on there, so. There's my fingerprints on the side here. Let's see if I can. Hmm, kind of they're stuck in there. That's okay. It's definitely we're gonna light. We're gonna use some white in here, and it's gonna change these values a bit. I feel it's almost still. 
I kind of want it to go a little bit darker. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow dry this and then I'm going to do it again, but this time I'm going to add a lot more of the matte medium in there. Okay. And actually, I, this is probably very close to what he would have actually done. Like, basically, you know, we've been doing this imprimatur with just this warm yellow for a long time. This is actually gets us a lot closer to the to a much more traditional imprimatur technique of just you're kind of stain lightly staining the canvas. But I think I just want it to stain a little bit more. So I'm going to blow dry it. Okay, I'm gonna, so I'm going to do this again. I'm actually going to tape it down because I don't want to get my fingerprints on the side there as they did. So I just want to help as I'm doing that scrubbing technique keep this painting in one place. I, now that I know I, this probably would have been something smarter to do right off the top. As I always say, you guys get to watch me fumble about and then you can make your decisions as what you want to do afterwards, right? So I'm gonna take let's take a bunch of maybe that's yeah, that's enough. I'm gonna put that on here. And just put a significant more amount more of medium to make it much more transparent. It's a little deceptive because it does look a little bit like I've added white to it. So it does look like I've tinted this color, even though when it dries, it, it's not going to quite, it'll go a little bit darker. It'll go back to what this is, right? So it's slight change, but as it dries, we'll have that transparency back. Also, while you're doing this, you want to use a rag that is gone through the wash so that it's not, um, uh, it's not going to leave any residue on here. It's, it's a big rag. Actually, that, this is a bad idea. So don't do use this rag like if you just torn it because it's going to leave residue. So I just need to keep looking for something smaller. Okay, here's some old rag. This is a good rag. Okay, so let's do this again. There we go. That's much more along the lines of what I wanted to do the first time around. Again, I want to get this on here quickly. And this time I don't know if I'm going to need to wipe any of it off. We'll see here really quickly.
So just try to spread this out as evenly as possible. I think good enough for government work, right? <laughs> so, you know what's super interesting is I have like a, a television monitor that I that I preview everything going out to the web and and often, you know, what looks it, I'll have the the image that I'm painting from this camera on the screen and then the original image side by side and I'm mixing to that and it's often it looks really good and then later on like last night I was looking at, at some of the previous episodes and going whoa some of those colors look a little bit different <laughs> so you know that's the difficulty when we're painting from an image that's online on a computer screen it can look very different on various different screens so um, that's my excuse anyway if I don't get the colors right <laughs> Oh, it's the computer screen that did it, not not my own incompetence, right? Okay, so let's <laughs> just clean up a few things here because it, it gets me anxious when I see my periphery is just full of things, so... So I have lost a little bit of the details, which you know is for me not a big deal. But I probably for for someone who's beginning, and I should also say that this is a more advanced episode. I mean, probably pretty clearly already for those of you that are new to the channel who are watching and be like, "Wow, this is like this is a beginner's right." This is a little obviously this is a little bit more advanced, right? We wouldn't do a Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> for one of your very very first paintings okay um i think it's time to sip a tea and take a look at leonardo okay um maybe just as a quick little background here leonardo da vinci born in 1452 dies in 1519 so he's born in Italy, in in uh, like Vinci, which is you know uh, like a a very very small town outside of Florence, and he dies. He spends the last three years of his life in France as part of the court of the King of France at the time, um, which is why the Mona Lisa ends up in France, not in Italy. Um, Leonardo was infamous you know he's very famous for being a great inventor for being um a uh, an early proponent of studying the human figure and not only just drawing the human figure but dissecting human corpses to understand anatomy better uh, he's very famous for his sketchbooks um but within like art circles he's also really well known as as like uh, an artist who finished very few paintings it left a lot of unfinished paintings um obviously he some of the most the, the paintings that he did leave that were finished are amongst the most famous paintings in human history um but uh, there is a lot of unfinished stuff which is why a painting like this you know lends its a lot of those unfinished paintings the attribution to them is a little bit dubious because was it something that a, a student of his or an apprentice of his was preparing for him because traditionally like a master like Leonardo would have 
two or three artists working in his studio that might be a little bit younger, often maybe as young as like when Michelangelo, I think, was like 13 years old when he began apprenticing. And so you have these younger artists that are in training. Like, this is because there was no art school at the time. And uh, they would do things like we just did, right? So all of these, the first few steps, this first 20 minutes of the show, right? That would have been the young apprentice would have been doing that, right? Would have been preparing the surface, stretching it, applying whatever mediums that existed at the time, like rabbit skin glue, literally boiling rabbit skin and, and taking the, the fats and applying them onto the canvas. And then afterwards, the master would come in and finish the painting, right? So it's, it's, it's disputed as to whether or not this was, you know, begun by a student and then Leonardo potentially did a little bit of the face or potentially Leonardo sketched it out and then had a student of his do the face. Again, some people think it's an, it's delib was deliberately left this way because, I mean, obviously it's, it's for past 500 years, it's taken on a life of its own and been appreciated a lot by artists around the world. So potentially Leonardo looked at it and went like, hey, I don't, I mean, I was gonna do a lot more to it, but kind of looks cool just like this I'm just gonna leave it like that right which should also be a good lesson for anyone else out there is that you know if you're if you just sort of get that feeling that your painting is done here's a good example of a painting that clearly was never there I mean again some people think it's unfinished some people think Leonardo just left it that way because he liked it um, okay I don't want to spend too much time going into his biography because we did that when we looked at the Mona Lisa. I, th I think didn't we? We talked about when we did we did a paint a Mona Lisa painting. Uh, so maybe I don't think we looked so much at the art of Leonardo da Vinci, the Annunciation. This is really his first major painting, and followed by here this portrait, which is at the National Gallery in Washington D.C. And it's a really beautiful painting. It's also kind of a strange painting because her her face looks quite flat. And so we're we're starting to kind of Leonardo is really practicing his technique, understanding um, a number of techniques that would make him faces famous, <laughs> uh, including the technique that he's probably most closely identified with is with the sfumato, and the sfumato is this. Uh, the technique that we see in the Mona Lisa, that very soft transitions, you know, let's say around the smile, right? People are like, is she, is she smiling? Is she frowning? It's because that really su hyper smooth, like there's no brush strokes that are discernible to the viewer, make it look kind of photographic, make it look realistic or naturalistic. Um, so we see it. Here's a lot of these sketches because that's a lot of what we have that have survived. Here's a, an unfinished, famous, unfinished Leonardo painting, Saint Jerome, and the adoration of the Magi. Another very famous Leonardo, uh, unfinished Leonardo painting. Um, The Virgin on the Rocks. There's a few versions of this. One of them is at the National Gallery in London, England. I encourage you to see that. And there's also, I think, the cartoon for it, which is the name for the drawing that artists created. The life-size drawing is, I think, right in behind that painting. It really, it's, it's been 20 years since I've been there, to, but that's the way it used to be displayed. Really, kind of, really, in this kind of darkened room, you'd go in and then you'd walk behind the painting and you see the cartoon displayed in behind it. And then we see all these uh, famous illustrations that he did of, you know, inventions. You know, there's a lot of things that have been attributed to Leonardo, like Leonardo invented the helicopter, the parachute, before there was even airplanes, and the hot air balloon, and um, scissors, and all these kind of things. And uh, all of those things are arguably true, the fact is, though, that Leonardo never published his his manuscripts, so um, you know it's it wasn't until like three hundred years later when people are looking through these sketches, being like, "Oh, hey, wait a minute! You know that 
helicopter thing flying around outside? We look at the sketch, it kind of looks like that, right? So, I mean, yeah, he might have had the idea, but did he actually invent it is another thing, right? That's that, that, It's an interesting philosophical discussion we could have. Um, and also, famously, Leonardo, in his sketchbooks, he's writing usually backwards and sometimes also backwards and upside down to help protect those uh, the knowledge that's in those books from anyone who might be casually looking through them uh, because the only way to decipher what he was doing besides carefully trying to read it upside down and backwards would be to use a mirror to see what that actually said and you could say well that's I'll just take a mirror 500 years ago mirrors were like rarer than than uh, gold. I mean, there were, a mirror would have been one of the most prized possession that a family, not even just a family, like a, a royal family would have had, right? So this is sort of a very early example of um, of an artist or a business person trying to protect their trade secrets. This is a, a famous, great painting by Leonardo. Lady with an ermine is probably considered to be his first great masterpiece, right? We saw a few other previous paintings that Leonardo did, which are also great paintings, but the Lady with an ermine, some people even consider to be his greatest painting. And then there's also a, a quite audible uh, group of people who believe that this is also a fake, right? So, I mean, uh, we see the Vitruvian Man, uh, ver uh, probably his most famous drawing of all time. Um, and the Last Supper. This is, we've talked about the Last Supper and how it was falling apart while he was painting it. I think that's really interesting. This is another painting that is, is um, are some many people dis dispute the fact that that's an, an actual Da Vinci painting. Um, this is um i'm trying to think if this saint john if this might be one of the lost paint anyway let's get, i want to kind of I'm, I'm kind of getting derailed here because i love looking at all these artworks but i do want to get this painting started here's the salvator mundi that famous painting that sold for 450 million dollars um a few years ago and was apparently the intent was it was going to go on display at the Louvre in is it Qatar or Dubai and uh, I it's sort of since disappeared I don't think anybody knows exactly where it is at this time uh, I love these drawings of Leonardo's it's worth just taking a moment like we, we did it I did a whole 45 episode drawing course it's worth just sort of taking a look at how loose these drawings are, how much some of them look like scribbles. Um, I love these, the drawings he did of like uh, storms and and waves are amazing. Like look how just really worked these drawings become. Uh, okay, so here's, here's the paint. Mona Lisa is gonna be right at the very end. Many people believe that the image that we're about to do here was a sketch for this painting, Lita and the Swan. We'll take a look at that in a moment. The, that painting no longer exists, or we don't think it exists anymore. It could be just lost and sitting in someone's bathroom. Uh, but these are reproductions by other artists who were alive at the time. So even they say Leonardo, those aren't actually by Leonardo, they're copies. Because Leonardo was famous while he was alive. He was like a very, very well-known artist. A bit of a, a controversial figure because he had made so many paintings that were left unfinished. And so there was a number of clients of his that were, you know, I don't know how you would, like, I don't know who would be an example of, like, he was this. He was a very famous guy, and you would come and you you know you you'd set him up in your. Uh, you'd be mostly painting churches or, or for kings and queens, 
And, you know, at that time, Italy isn't, wasn't one big country. There were a whole bunch of these small, like, city-states. And he would sort of travel and around in between. And he'd be put up in, in like, a, in, in a big house and be, be making a painting. And then, you know, he might... There'd be sort of... Because he was an inventor, he'd be trying to play with all these different pigments and paints. And the paintings would be falling apart like The Last Supper while he's painting on it. And then he just, like, one day packs up and leaves, and people, like, walk in, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, if you're getting your bathroom renovated and the contractor just up and left one day, and you don't have a toilet to sit on, you've got the sinks and everything, and you're just like, what on, like, and you're trying to get a hold of this guy, <laughs> Leonardo is off, and he's starting working on something else, right? So he had a reputation for being this guy that was not the most dependable responsible person on earth and a little bit flighty but there was also you're rolling the dice because you're you know like wow this guy is an amazing artist like yeah there's the potential we could pay and to have him come to our, our place and to make a painting but he, he could also just bail on us at any time but if he made something great you know we would be the talk of the town or of the of the land, right? Imagine if we had a, a, you know, one of these great paintings of his in our in our castle. All the other uh, kings nearby would we would be like it would be very exciting, right? Okay, so we see Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, one of the very last paintings that he was working on right up until he died. We can also see how long he spent working on it. <laughs> <laughs> right? I've told you, like, Leonardo... I mean, this is... You know, these dates here are, you know, a little bit... Um, uh, we're not exactly sure what those are, but it is known that he worked on it for years. Uh, I don't know if he worked on it for 15-plus years, but at least three or four years and maybe coming back and working on it a little bit longer. Which is why, though, we've got that really beautiful softness. Um, okay, so... Let me see. What else do I want to mention? All right, so they're just talking about the painting that we're about to work on. The scapigliata and the sfumato technique, right? The, the super soft transitions between light and dark here. Um, so here's, you know, one of the... This is a sketch that we know Leonardo made. This is the, a version of the painting. Um finished painting right so even like Raphael made sketches of Leonardo paintings Leonardo was a little bit older than um, Michelangelo and Raphael not Donatello Donatello was a little bit older so if you're a fan of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> Donatello is, is even old from a previous generation of Le than Leonardo and again this is another painting that some believe this image that we're about to paint was from uh, the study of the Virgin on the Rocks. Uh, lastly, just before we, we, we wrap up and, we, and I start making the, actually doing the painting on this surface here, I think it's worth just noting, I, as I was putting the episode together, I was a little bit confused as to where this painting actually exists. Most sources say that it's uh, at the National Gallery in Parma, Italy. But interestingly enough, the Metropolitan Museum of Art claims to have... I mean, it's on their website. Um, I don't know if it's on, like, long-term loan. It's, it says it's not on currently on view. So I, I just found that really interesting. Like, oh, why is this listed as part of the Metropolitan... Which, you know, that is a major museum in New York City. Uh, so anyway, let's, let's get into the painting here, and we'll... Well, uh, we can talk about some of these things going a little bit more going forward. <laughs> I was like, oh no, how did it get stuck to the table? <laughs> I realized oh, it's because I put tape on the back. Um, so I think I need to, I can take that tape off now. Okay, so our next step here uh, for this painting will be to paint some of these lines on here and we're also going to paint on the face and then we're going to come back and we're going to add a little bit of lighter values to bring out the face so we want to have this kind of painterly approach to the, to the way that we do these lines and uh, and painterly is a is a 
is um, is a word that artists use. It's it's actually a technique. To, this painterly technique is is a technique where we do see the brushes, right? It's it's um, it's in in a way it's it's the opposite of sfumato, but artists began using it as part of the underpainting process and then would glaze and do this fumato technique over top of that as time progressed and the centuries went by there were artists that decided what if we do that painterly thing and just leave it like that right and that's you know long story short we got impressionism <laughs> and then long story short after that we've got abstract expressionism jackson pollock and all sorts of stuff right okay so let's this color that we mixed previously we could use this there is it's been pretty significant well I wonder if we put a, mix a little bit of uh, more of this blue in here, what we'll get. My my instinct is a, is maybe to mix this again because the matte medium is getting kind of sticky. So even though this would be very convenient to use that, I think I'm just going to mix this again so that uh, I'm not tearing my hair out in frustration. Which is it's, this is fine, right? We mix learning to mix colors over and over again is is. A really worthwhile exercise anyway so let's just put a little bit more paint back on the palette here okay. so I'm just gonna mix a, this basically the same color we had there before I'm taking my warm yellow, my warm red, and my warm blue together, and that's going to make our brown. Now I'm going to again, I'm going to add some more of this cool blue into the mixture and that combined with the warm red which I just put way too much of is going to help make this color go much darker right because again if we think of like this painting in terms of value right we want something that will be darker than this Right? Not overly dark because, you know, Leonardo, even in this situation, he's still very famous for his subtlety. All right, so I'm put a little bit more of this cool blue in there and it quickly gets absorbed. Remember that cool or cool blue, oops, cool blue and warm red and cool yellow make black. Right? So by increasing those mixtures in fact we, let's just do that let's just mix this right off to the side here So that still has got a bit of a greenish quality, which means I just need more red. Let's 
so I can I'm actually just gonna take this color that's on my brush right here and just add it right in here just to darken this down even more That should be more than, than dark enough. Certainly, if you wanted to go darker, let's say you're, you're a little bit anxious about, you want a higher contrast, you want to amp that up even more, We you could certainly use, I, I would not use black right out of the tube, but I think using a kind of a darker brown, I think would be, would be a good idea if you wanted. So, how small of a brush should I go here? I don't want to go too small. Uh, I want to start out with kind of my larger brush strokes in here. It's like, so this brush has kind of gotten a little bit... fuzzy. Let's see if we can mix a bit of paint on it. If it holds its shape. Well, that's pretty good. Okay, so let's so that's her hair. This is kind of like at the eyebrow ridge right there. Let's zoom in here so you can just see. And you can also, if you're, if you find that kind of confusing, you can also kind of go back to the outline too, right? So if you want you feel like oh it might be helpful to have that in in there to kind of see some of those lines um, remember we're gonna put some white over top of a lot of stuff here So I lost the tip of her nose in here somewhere, so we'll see if I can find that again.
So my goal here is just to kind of, it's it's like I often do at the beginning of a painting, just to try to get the lines down before I put any other uh, lighter values over top. So if you're unhappy with things here, that's okay. We're, you're going to have a second opportunity to kind of quote unquote fix it later. Let's just look at this one here. Is there something going on with these lips that I'll have to problem solve? So some of these lines in her hair, all those kind of things, those these are going to be kind of in place. There's not going to be a lot of, I really don't want to have to redo any of these. It's really, the this is the main area where we're going to be spending most of the time today after I just get these lines in place, right? kind of eyeballing a little bit of this because I, I lost a few of those lines so that's okay So I find all this kind of very fun stuff to do because we can be use a certain amount of 
interpretation here, right? There's exactly what is there is kind of faded quite a lot over time. And what Leonardo's doing here is kind of just basically sketching in the composition for this painting. All right, so he, he might have been doing this painting while someone was sitting in front of him, whoever this, yikes. <laughs> Always, whenever that paper falls out of my hand, it's like, oh, throw it anywhere else but on top of this painting. Um, so... We did something similar to this when we did the Berta Morisot painting. There was a vase of flowers. We did that probably almost two years ago. And that was really one of the first times where we started to incorporate the, um, both the imprimatura, and, we, and I think we did that without, we basically just painted directly onto the canvas. I can't remember, we might have done a very simple sketch to get started, but um, so I'm just looking at, I just have this sitting here in front of me, just on, on top of my palette, and I'm just looking at that and just trying to see if I can match up some, the, the few lines that I can still see through here. And if later on I look at this and go like, oh, there was a few things missing here, or where did I, where did I put that line? That, that line wasn't really there, was it? I don't know. Is that, a, is that a big deal? I don't know, is it? You know, often when they're doing x-rays of paintings, this is the kind of thing that we see coming through the x-ray. This initial bit of painting to help an artist kind of figure out the composition. There is this kind of dead space down here on the bottom. You know, do I want to fill that in or leave it? You know, the original doesn't. It, you know, it, it doesn't have it, anything there. I mean, you could. It's up to you to decide if you do see anything there. Obviously, you know, the nose. There was a little. I had a little bit of difficulty there, but that's okay because we're gonna go into this here in a moment. Just trying to see if there's any glaring things that I've missed thus far. You know, I might even I do a little bit of glazing with this color just to give a little bit of shadow back here, but I think I'll wait until I get more of the face done. Okay. Wow, tons of comments. Sorry, I haven't had a chance to really look at, at any of these. <laughs> uh, 
Um, trying to see if there's anyone that has looks like some really interesting conversation. Just want to see if anyone has any questions for me. Deborah says, hi everyone, this is one of my favorite paintings. I wanted my son to replicate this painting when I turned 50 almost 20 years ago. This painting is in the movie Ever After, and I love it. Interesting. I'm, I'm, Ever After. I don't know if I've seen that movie. I've, maybe I've heard it. I've heard of it. I, um, I'll have to look that up. Interesting. Ever After. Now you got my interest. Um, people are talking about I asked earlier what's your favorite Leonardo painting and Pascal says the Virgin on the Rock to Last Supper are pretty cool but the Vertruvian Man is cool not sure if it counts as a painting though does it it's very simple but simple is cool too yes absolutely <laughs> um, okay so, uh, let's see. That looks like it's everything is dried pretty well. You know, when we start doing any kind of glazing, we just want to make sure that this is nice and dry so that we're not smudging any of this paint into our glaze because that's usually the main problem I find with, with glazing. So I am just out of a little abundance of caution because this painting, there's not a lot of room for... Uh, for error, I guess, because it's not like, you know, if we mess up something here that we can just fix the background really easily, right? That would be kind of tricky to do if we had to to paint something out. Uh, so we want to try to, I want to just take that extra second just to add a little bit of heat to this and make sure this is well cured. So we'll give me a moment. That's funny. Uh, about the movie Ever After, Gail says, You will see it, Michael, since you have a little girl. Okay, so... <laughs> it's one of those movies, yes. Okay. Kind of like... Well, I remember... I don't know if it's like The Princess Bride, but that's a movie I remember watching hundreds of times as a kid. Um, and it's still a lot of fun, you know. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And that's kind of like a fairy tale as well. I mean, I'm assuming what that's what Ever After is. It sounds kind of a, a, like a fairy tale. Okay. Now, <laughs> just delaying because I'm like, oh goodness. Okay, so um, what color do we want? I mean. We could, that color might be a little bit dark if we start adding white to it. That's my little bit of a fear. Um, we still, we do have lots of it. So it, it might, might be okay just to try and just see what results here. So one of the things, again, that Leonardo is famous for is is lots of very thin glazes, right? So we're going to use some glazing fluid. Before I do that, I just want to try to mix a little bit of this color up. So actually, I should, probably should have put white on my on here. Anyway, let's just take this, put the white in. Ah, I didn't realize there was going to be some red in there. I wanted it to go a bit more yellow. So let's get some more.
that's not bad actually I'm pretty happy with that so I'm of two minds right now we could use uh, if, if you don't have glazing fluid you could use matte medium just to get a bit of a thinner layer the the difference between these two products and I've mentioned this before but the matte medium is going to dry a little bit faster than glazing fluid. Glazing fluid is, has a bit of a slow dry quality to it. Certainly not as much as an actual slow dry medium. But if we're trying to get something very thin and we want a little bit more uh, play time, a little bit more for the paint to stay open a little bit longer. I mean, so open mean like so it's not going to dry quite as fast. Then your glazing fluid is probably a better bet so I'm gonna use glazing fluid here and I'm gonna put it right in there maybe I'm gonna come down here Now, one might be tempted to just do the whole face with this color, but if we look here, there are places where he's used very, it, either very little glaze, like some of these darker areas. We can do that with going back over top of it with a darker glaze, but I, I would bet he's using a little bit of that is actually just the, the this, you know, like this area. Like he's just leaving it a bit blank and just sort of using the darker, the imprimatura as the as sort of a mid-range. Because sort of the idea of the, of the imprimatura is you have this mid-range value and then you can go lighter, lighter like we're about to do. And then you can also go darker like these lines. So you already, ha you kind of have this color acts as that in-between. So, so instead of taking a painting that begins on a white canvas and usually we're just darkening it. You get, it gets darker, 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 right? Maybe a few little highlights on top, um, you know, or painting on a black canvas where it's everything has to get starts down here and gets lighter and lighter and goes up. When we have something that's in the middle, we have kind of, we can go up and down, if that makes any sense. <laughs> okay, so let's... We'll just uh, launch right in here to see how well I've mixed this. So what I like about this so far is it's quite transparent. I still see the texture of the canvas coming through. If you're at all kind of anxious about Having put too much, you can also just use a, a little cloth and just sort of wipe a bit away. I'm, I'm kind of happy so far, as I just start. <sighs> and you know, here's this nose and I kind of goofed in this area, so I'll just go back over that area. So I'm just kind of softly Painting this in here. Now we're, we're gonna do a few layers of this, but you know, taking our time, I think is, is a good idea. Because if we do a good enough job of this, then we don't have to ultimately darken anything, or, or very little of it needs to be darkened.
I also think there might be just a little bit down here. Alright, we can just use this rag to kind of soften that up a bit. Okay. I might have done a little bit in the hair right up here too, so. That might be enough for this initial pass on there. Maybe just... The bottom lip is going to get m most of the highlight. Okay, so I want to let this dry before I do anything else. I'm going to use the blow dryer to help speed that process up. Okay, so I'm going to blow dry that. Now, one might be tempted to just add more and more white here to speed this process up. You could do that. You're not going to get quite the results that Leonardo got. Again, this the way that Leonardo painted was about as slow and methodical of a process as you can possibly imagine. Right, so we can just use the exact same glaze in fact you could even it could even be a little bit more diluted but i'm just going to keep on going here and i'm also going to use my a blending brush just a, this mop brush to kind of help soften some edges if need be So I'm, I'm just going to kind of go a little bit less and less over some areas. And eventually I'm going to start downshifting to a smaller brush.
and you know there's parts of this where you know wasn't so happy with my outlining like this chin so I have to kind of maybe do a little bit more there Pretty good. Okay, so I'm just gonna blow that, dry that again. So, you know, I look at this side by side, and this is starting to look now a little bit more gray, right? And it's looking a little bit pale. So I think what I want to do now is I want to add a bit more white into my mixture. So that I don't, uh, I want to keep some, um, I don't want to get too, like a sickly kind of quality here. So I'm gonna take some of this white and a bit of this paint here. I mean, as I'm painting, I'm like, it's like, man, this is a, like the level of subtlety in here is pretty intense. And, you know, we're not exactly sure when he made this, probably at kind of the height of his powers. So you're like, oh, if you're, if, if you find this painting a little bit difficult, you're probably in great company. <laughs> right, so just a, a bit of a difference here between this color and this one. Obviously, there's a lot more white in it, but a, a, a good amount of glazing fluid as well. So let's keep on going here. That's a lot. It's intense. I don't know. You know, if you're using a blending brush like this, you want to blend maybe 10 seconds or so after you've applied it on there. You don't want to wait too long before you start trying to blend your paint out. And if you've already got some paint down, you, it's probably best rather than, you know, to try to fix something, just to let it sit, blow dry it, and then come back. So there's this highlight on the cheek here. I'm still using a relatively big brush for all of this as well. I haven't shifted down to anything smaller. Which 
just yet. feeling like I might at the end need to glaze a little, maybe I should have had a little bit more warm yellow in my color it's looking very white I need a little bit more yellow in there so that's just something I'm just noticing I didn't think about I did a little bit earlier but I kind of guess I forgot alright so I think what I want is just a bit more of that warm yellow. Okay, so I'm going to blow dry this again. You know, worse comes to worse if you if you do this and then you feel like ah that face just looks really white, right? You could at the very end and maybe I'll end up having to do this is put a bit of like a a very delicate glaze over top of the whole thing that brings back a little bit more yellow into this image, kind of a brownish yellow. Um, again, we're talking about one of the greatest artists in if not the greatest artist in human history, and we're trying to replicate. A technique that he did that probably took him like at the very least of uh, probably two or three days and we're trying to do it in about two three hours <laughs> yeah you know it's like it's kind of a fool's errand here there that's much better it's probably I don't know how well that shows up on camera but just that little bit of yellow back in there I think is Is uh, nice. I mean, so if this was actually done by one of his students, it must have been one of the very best, right? I don't really know too much about the students of Leonardo. I, I don't think they, they ever really became that well known.
Side oh, maybe we come in here. He's got. A, I don't know if this is just the. It's hard to know what is paint and what is, you know, the the underlying layer there. Come in. My brush is, is almost like a little bit of a dry brush in here. I'm gonna, I just have this desire to want to just lightly glaze a few other things here because, as you know, a little bit of this will catch the light. You know, if you dim your lights down after you do a little bit of this. Just get these little, like, barely little pops of light. Super subtle. dry that I think what I'm gonna do next is I'll blow dry this and then I'm going to do one more a little bit of, of white or slightly yellowish white and then I'm gonna start doing some darker values in here so that I can kind of because right now I've, I've, we have this middle value which is this imprimatur we put down uh, the brown yellowish brown and then we've gone lighter and now we want to then afterwards darken it back down. Okay. a bit of a smaller brush. I'm going to put a little bit more white in here. Glazing fluid. way too solid of a, of a color so I'm just gonna put a little glazing fluid down next to it and then just dilute this this what I'm about to do is just like just some small highlights like on the nose bridge in the nose etc So I keep darkening the tip of this nose because I, I wasn't happy with where I put that line initially. So I'm going to darken that, but I just wanted to, I had to use a little bit more white in order to, to solve. 
solve that issue there. So I think I've done about as much as I want to do at this moment. It kind of looks probably not the best at this moment, but once we uh, get some of the darker values, I think that will alleviate any kind of anxiety people might have just looking at it at the moment. So actually, I should blow dry this before I add any more paint. Okay, so I think I'm going to use the dark color that I had here previously. Uh, that, that this is basically the this is the color that we use to do those um, uh, like the hair and all those outlines. So I'm going to dilute it significantly with some glazing fluid. And again, just like doing the highlights, we can really take our time with does literally dozens of layers of very thin glaze. Glaze it is so thin that you barely notice any change in value whatsoever. But the cumulative effect is that we can we get something that where we just literally see no brush strokes whatsoever. Just sort of this face is appearing out of the canvas. So I'm going to take this and kind of paint it. Like it's interesting, that color almost, it looks like it, I've just sort of wiped away some of that white. Right? It's, it does, has a kind of interesting effect here. Because what it's doing is sort of diluting a little bit of that white and, and kind of returning it to this value before it goes darker, right? So if I paint right over the white, it's going to get a little bit lighter before it gets darker.
cake. Bag of this. Kind of slow, methodical work. Okay, um, maybe let's zoom out here. Sometimes it's a little hard to see for me, anyway. I'm super close in. in retrospect maybe I, I probably could have gone just using a lot more warm yellow instead of this white and then just a little bit of tinting of that white but you know you never really know these things until you've done it so every painting's a learning lesson want to do is I think I want to get a little bit more of this darker color and I'm going to mix it on to my brush still keep a bit of the glazing fluid on there because one great thing about glazing fluid is because it has a bit of slow dry property it will allow me to wipe things away if I am not happy with them
this there's this mouth is going to give me some fits I can feel it I come in and I just want to reline this Using much darker. Oops. In fact, I should probably pause here in a moment and just blow dry some of this because I'm starting to kind of build up a lot of sticky glaze. try. Again, I, I have sort of a few different mixtures here. Here's basically that same paint, just on its own. Here's some with a little bit of glazing fluid. Here's some with a lot more. So I'm kind of in this area where I've got a little bit of glazing fluid and that darker color. This is just, it's gorgeous. It's also really <laughs> tricky, right? To try to get this level of subtlety.
I mean, again, that's the the subtlety here is like, where exactly is the eye? Where, you know, when I was tr doing my drawing, tracing of it, I was like, where exactly is she looking? Is her eye pointing this way? Is it pointing this way? The really, it's, you know, it, it's almost, it's like that uh, Mona Lisa smile kind of thing. Like, you're kind of like, I'm not exactly sure where it is in there. It's somewhere in there, obviously, but... Here with my darkest color again so I want to have on that eye, uh, even though they're not quite exactly there. I, I'm not quite as the master <laughs> like Leonardo, so I need every little helper I can get to help me here. Let's, I want to do a little bit of small bit of outlining on this cheek because we're also going to darken this this area under here. I want to blow dry that before I do anything more there.
Okay, so I'm gonna blow dry that. It's coming along. It's, it's slow, right? But uh, I'm starting to feel better. I was having some difficulty with this mouth in that I don't know if it's. I have to, let me just actually look at my outline here. Oh, I think I got it on the outline. It's just when I painted it, I think I made this kind of coming up so that the whole mouth was kind of tilted. Whereas I always want to try to make sure that it's in line with these eyes. Right? If anything, it could still go even further down here. So that means I'm just going to have to lighten above there just a bit. Oh yeah, I want to blow dry everything. <laughs> Let's do that. One of the tricks that artists use to help them see value contrast easier, and it's kind of a cliche, is when you squint your eyes, right? So if you're looking at your painting, just squint your eyes, like you're, and that's gonna blur the image, but it's also gonna help you see the contrast between light and dark a little bit stronger. So, you know, if I, if you're kind of at this point where I am, and you look at it, and it still looks, we don't see like the cheek and the nose advancing towards us and the forehead, it still looks very flat. That means we haven't been bold enough with our contrasts yet. And obviously, again, we're talking about one of the great artists of all time, and he's managing... There's not a lot of... Con, but there, I mean, we do have in this image... You know, the, these areas are almost pure white. They're a little bit more on the yellowy side, but they're they're very bright, very high value. And then our darkest values, he's reserving for maybe the pupil of the eyes, underneath the eyelids, this sort of line between the nose, a little bit in the nostril, this side of the cheek here, maybe underneath the neck, which I haven't done yet, and a few dashes in the hair. So it's very, very subtle. In fact, right now, this reminds me a lot of like the Picasso paintings that he was doing in the late 19, like 1919 to 23 ish, his sort of so called neoclassical period. Because he was sort of, I think, looking back, he, he had spent some time in Italy looking at all this work, and uh, he found that very inspiring. So, which it is. So let's, oh, I put a bunch of brushes in here to clean. When I'm using brushes for glazing, I like to have them as dry as possible. 
so that I'm because the water is going to um, scrub paint away. I don't want to scrub paint away. I want to add paint, right? Okay. Heidi says there is dark shading on the face. Yes, definitely. Yeah, right here on the cheek for sure. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's come back to, here, so I want to start kind of darkening in this area as well. Let's go for some of this a little bit darker glaze. Put a bit more glazing fluid on it. Right, look how all of a sudden that makes what a huge difference it makes that face really pop forward let's do this underneath the neck as well shoulder so just this little side of her cheek I'm coming back down on here to darken that that'll take a few layers to do transitions Soften up those features a bit. Same thing here. Okay, I think I need to maybe just a bit more on this nose underneath here. Let's 
darken that. blow dry that again. So one thing I just want to do, I want to come back to this, uh, this eye here, I'm just looking at, at them side by side, I want to bring, the corner of that eye up, it was kind of unclear, it made her eye look really, really big. I'm just going to keep on going ahead here with these very subtle shadows. taking a lot more glazing food to get this a little bit darker in here a little bit more quickly. in this area again. It's 
hard not to get a little bit impatient and want to speed things up. That's natural. I've got to blow dry a few of those rather than So yeah, let's blow dry that, and then... taking a little bit more of my darkest color getting more glazing fluid on it so it's not just pure dark but it's going to be much darker I want to get underneath this the chin there Okay, I think I'll blow dry one more. I think I'll do a little bit more dark and then I might we might just start wrapping up.
So I'm being much more aggressive with my application of dark here just to push things along. I can't remember, did I, when was the last time I blew, yeah, I would have to do a little bit more. How about, let's just take a look, if we zoom out, and just think about the overall picture and any other dark glazes we might want to do. I'm going to put a little bit more glazing fluid on here, get a little bit more of my darker color. And... I want to put a little bit of darker value into her hair up here.
Okay, I'm gonna blow dry it again. I see Heidi says um, it almost has a marble look to it. It's like it's carved from rock. What a fun painting to do. I'm really glad you're doing this one. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the... I mean, I love this painting, but I think it really it works perfectly for what we're you know kind of following from the value lesson last time. Uh, Tony says, I'm glad to watch this. It's a great lesson on glazing. The smooth gradations are really coming through. Good to hear. I'm glad. Um, so let's do... I want to do a little bit more... Uh, I have to just be careful. You know, sometimes at the end of a painting like this, I just get very impatient, and I want to finish, wrap it up, and that's usually when I get sloppy. get a bit more of a smile in here. Um, so I'm going to blow dry that and just try to get a little bit more of a peek in here.
kind of obsessed with, you I mean, the subtlety that he's got here.
Ah, I was on mute. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me let me think about what I was just talking about before. <laughs> Pigliata. So Tanya said, uh, sorry, I was late coming in. Would these techniques attribute to the Sumato technique? And so what I was saying is, is yes, basically what we were, we, we spent most of the episode doing was attempting to use glazing to, to mimic that Sumato technique, which is what Leonardo did. Um, he obviously just did it much better, right? I mean, he is the the greatest of all time. So, you know, I, I'm not too too bummed out with with the results here. And but uh, um, it's that very subtle transition. Sumato means sort of like the like a hazy, foggy, um, where we just do not see any brush strokes whatsoever. Right, because just the blending has been done so masterfully, and Leonardo used that in in most of his his finished works. The, his unfinished paintings look a little bit more like this, but even then, he's, he's such a master that he could pull that off. But I think you you could see that if you really worked on this technique, you you can go pretty far with it, right? I mean, this is this is what Leonardo and all the great Renaissance painters did. So. Anyway, thank you everyone for painting along with me once again. Uh, I really look forward to seeing what you've created today or anything else you've been painting. Join the Facebook page or Facebook group. There's a link in the description below. I think it's the very first thing. Join the group, upload your painting. And this Saturday, we're going to do a feedback episode. We're going to take a look at all the great work that people have been up to over the last little while. If you want to support the show, if you think this was worth a dollar, uh, certainly I would be uh, honored to receive it to help keep the show up and running so there's a link to the PayPal below here there's also the super chat function in uh, YouTube and if you want to send a good old-fashioned check or e-transfer contact me through the Facebook group or my website those are all down there somewhere okay everyone enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you guys in a few days on Saturday enjoy the rest of your afternoon okay everyone uh, I gotta cue this up. <laughs> uh, you hate saying goodbye many, many times, right? Well, goodbye one more time, everybody. Have a great night. <laughs>